You know, a lot of patients, when they are posed with the uh, potential for going to a sleep center and sleeping, come across all these ideas that make them feel very uncomfortable. One of them is sleeping in a foreign place. A lot of people can't do that, you know. Um, second, especially, by the way, with a camera watching you, uh, they, they, they get all weirded out over it. Second, they all kind of know that they're going to have wires hooked up to them, and they're going to think, how am I going to sleep with wires all over me, you know? What I tell some of my primary care colleagues is this, and I've done it myself, of course, uh, go to a sleep center and sleep overnight and see what it's like. Actually, it's not so bad. The rooms are very comfortable. They look like a hotel room. So if you don't have a problem sleeping in a hotel room, you're going to be fine. They're comfortable, um, and the camera is very, you know, um, inobtrusive. It's sort of uh, not really there that you can see. And the wires are not so bad. I had a good night's sleep sleeping in, at, a, uh, at a sleep lab. All of the preliminaries is what's really important, which is you have a problem that you must solve. If you don't solve the problem of obstructive sleep apnea, you are going to live less for sure, and bad problems are going to occur. You're going to feel terrible during the time. You're going to have a higher chance of depression, not sleeping well, um, and feeling tired throughout the day. You want to go on like this? You know, the funny thing in, sleep me in, in uh, primary care medicine, we help our patients do two main things, help them feel well for as long as possible. Obstructive sleep apnea robs patients of both of those. It robs them of longevity and quality of life. So if a patient is convinced that obstructive sleep apnea that they have is robbing them of quality of life and it's going to decrease their life expectancy, they're much more likely uh, to go to a sleep center and look at what it's like and get testing done. Again, in some cases, that's the right test to do. Uh, we do home sleep testing in some patients, which only have three wires and one tiny machine in a, in a very familiar environment, when we're convinced that the patient most likely has obstructive sleep apnea, and we're trying to understand the degree of apnea that they do have, and they probably don't have any other medical conditions or any other reasons for sleep problems. So when patients do go to a sleep center, we're looking for what's the cause of their sleep problem and looking for things like sleep apnea plus many other things that could be occurring. For example, periodic limb movement disorder, parasomnias, uh, REM behavior disorder, all these come out in a sleep study that can't come out in anything except that at a sleep center. So a good sleep lab can make it easier. By the way, in the pediatric situation, what they do is they put the wires and they put a fishnet on, on the children's head so they can sleep a lot earlier. And yes, by the way, children can get sleep studies and I have sent them to it. Uh, the area of sleep problems, especially obstructive sleep apnea, is rising in children because uh, ob obesity and large tonsils and, and not enough airway is one of the biggest causes of obstructive sleep apnea in children. The most promising areas of research that we have right now in the area of sleep problems with patients um, uh, are in several different arenas. One of them is in insomnia, trouble getting to sleep and staying asleep. Uh, what we have known for many years, by the way, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Going to a sleep coach can be very helpful. Um, having this kind of treatment more available to, to uh, uh, our, our patients and to having it introduced into primary care as a major avenue that we'd like to see more of. In the medication field, there are more and more medicines coming out that are different from the previous ones out there that have caused some problems. Some of the medicines that you may know of, patients have woken up in the middle of the night, they call their friends, uh, they order online, uh, you know, they, they place orders online, uh, they go shopping, this, they have no recollection of it. And they do quirky things that are not healthy, like driving, and they don't remember it. So there are newer medicines coming out that don't have that, okay, to help patients get to sleep and stay asleep and feel refreshed throughout the day. We're trying more and more in research to identify medications that are much better suited for these patients who have an insomnia problem by identifying where the real problem is in the central nervous system, in that sleep area in the part of the brain that helps with sleep. There's also research going on in, in uh, patients that have specific problems. For blind people, for example, they have different kinds of sleep problems. There are medicines out now for blind people and the kind of uh, sleep problems that they do have. The main area that's coming out uh, with obstructive sleep apnea is, uh, is in the, the different kinds of positive airway machines, and they're working out pretty good. And also, this INSPIRE method, uh, which is uh, 
um, the uh, little sensor that's placed in the chest with a wire that goes up to the, to the neck. That seems to be a very good one. Thankfully, many sleep centers that do research are trying to find out the causative areas of all these sleep problems and trying to give us in primary care a better understanding of them and a better way to help our patients get a better night's sleep. Because after all, what we said earlier, is sleep is one of the most critical things that we can do in life, that we must do in life, for us to stay healthy and live long. You know, a common question that I get is what percentage of the population has sleep problems? And for that matter, what percentage of the population of clinicians have sleep problems? The National Sleep Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that does research every year and does polling, has done one poll where they asked the average population, you know, uh, what percentage of the time do you feel as if you get good sleep almost every night of the month? It's only 50%. Half of the people say, yeah, one night a month or more, I sleep poorly. And those who say, I sleep poorly, most nights of the week than not is between 50 and 20%. Insomnia is one out of three people. So the, the, the percentage of people out there that sleep poorly is huge. We clinicians are actually worse. When I go to, uh, to conferences and I give large-scale talks, I will research the audience. I'll give a talk to a group of 500 or 700 people. And uh, the Epworth sleepiness scale, that's one of them what we talked about earlier, is abnormal in about 10-15% uh, of, of patients. About 10-15% to 15 of the population has abnormal drowsiness. In clinicians, it's usually 20%, you know? Maybe clinicians think that, you know, drowsiness is not so bad. So one of the interesting things is clinicians themselves are not seeing the perils of poor sleep or even drowsiness. How could they then go to patients and say, this is a problem? Clinicians need to know that their sleep problems are bad and they need to be rectified. Then take that to their patients and say that it is important, whether it's a sleep problem or daytime sleepiness or excessive sleepiness, as we've called it earlier. They need to know that because clinicians are actually suffering even more, indicating to me that they're not as aware of the problem as they should be.